I remember meeting a woman named Barbara in a workshop two or three years ago who had, Barbara had the most infectious laugh. She had one of those laughs where, you know, you would laugh just hearing her laugh. And I commented, I said, Barbara, you, I love your laugh. You know, we were in a mixed, mixed gender group. And she said, it's so funny that you say that. She said, when I first began, she's an accountant, she said, when I first began as a, an accountant, my boss, within a couple of months, now she must have been young, I'm gonna guess she was in her 20s, she said, my boss called me into his office and he said, Barbara, lose the laugh. It's unprofessional. I mean, literally when she said that to me, I, my heart hurt a little bit. Like, she said, for 15 years, I didn't laugh at work. And that's, you know, that's really what it's like for us as women leaders. And I think one of the central themes that I see is that we learn we learned to give up, in some cases, the best parts of who we are to fit in. You know, and have you, any of you experienced that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where you, it didn't really work for you to be who you were. So that's part of what I want to do, and at least my mission in women's leadership has been for women, first of all, to acknowledge that, to see what they gave up to fit in. And then second, to see if there's a way for us to reclaim all of that. Because what I know for sure is that the world needs right now what we have to offer. There is some, in my way of looking, there is a fundamental imbalance that's happened. And we see it on the news, we see it in our education systems, we see it in our corporate governance, we see it in every area that we can look, we see an imbalance. So what I wanna do um, is really kind of talk about why we need more women leaders because there's don't you have this idea that we need more yes yeah I have an idea like yeah we need more I remember having a conversation with a colleague of mine and he said so there's 14 percent of women in senior level positions of leadership who says that's not enough I said I say it's not enough I say there are 51% of women in the workforce today and that that number should be equally represented at senior level leadership teams. Now, is that right? I don't know, so I do the research. He says, well, you tell me why that matters. You tell me statistically why that would make a difference. And you know, it was one of those conversations where I kind of got like, all right, I'm gonna go find the data then. <laughs> so out I went looking for the data, you know? And I, I think he meant to provoke me, which is great. His name is Ron, he's a good guy. So here's what I wanna, I wanna share two statistics with you. The first comes from Catalyst Research Firm, and many of us know of Catalyst. They did a study in 2004, I'm gonna read this. It says, quote, corporations with large percentages of women on their executive leadership teams gain returns 35% higher than those without. Now that's a direct bottom line impact. Oh, love an Don't you love that? Catalyst 2004. So we know for sure that it increases the returns that are happening in corporations. Uh, here's a second statistic. And this one is done uh, from a study by the World Bank. And this is much, much more of a global kind of statistic. They say that empowering women and girls has the greatest overall effect on a society in these ways. It's measured by decreased population growth, faster economic growth, less corruption in governance, increased agricultural production, more children being educated. So we know that when women are in leadership positions in a, in a uh, town or a community that will have higher levels of education and will have lower childhood malnutrition and mortality rates. So if we know that, so we know the impact in terms of on corporations, right, a higher bottom line return, and now we know that actually a whole society is increased and improved when there are more women in positions of leadership. And I've been actively involved in a couple of organizations. One is called the Hunger Project.
that is now focusing, the Hunger Project for 28 years has been trying to solve the problem of chronic hunger. Some of you, do you know if anybody know of the, the Hunger Project? Mm -hmm. You've heard of it. It's been around. John Denver was very involved in it, the very beginning of it. They have just recently, in the last five years, determined that the central key, like the key that turns the lock to hunger, is the disempowerment of women and girls. That if a, if a woman can, if she has the means to feed her family, she will. And that in some of these developing countries where women are so severely disempowered, we have ongoing and increasing chronic hunger and mal malnourishment. All right, so how does that relate to us here? Well, we are being disempowered in this country in more subtle ways. You know, in some ways, in South Africa or in Bangladesh, it's easier to name the disempowerment because it's so visible. So what I want us to look at is how are we disempowered here? And I want to really look at it from a couple of different ways. How are we disempowered personally? In other words, you know we disempower ourselves, right? I disempower myself. It's, the, the book came out on Thursday. And can I borrow yours? The book came out and I, I got it out of the box. Now this has been like a two and a half year project. But it's kind of a big deal. You know, and there's a lot of people working on it, and there's cover designers and production people on the inside and all that sort of stuff. And I got it out, and I immediately thought, oh, it's too skinny. <laughs> it's not even really worth reading. No. And I instantly disempowered myself. Mm -hmm. I instantly, and I then, because it had been so long since I read it, I had all these thoughts about, what if it's not even worth reading? And I was actually afraid to open it. So th I, we got the book on Thursday. My husband was out of town. He came home Friday night. I was kind of in, still in this glum kind of play. Have you ever done this where you just kind of take away your best success? Mm -hmm. So Saturday morning, he said, sweetheart, get the book. I want you to read the introduction to me. So, you know, I sort of snuggle up in bed with the big pillows behind me and I open the book and I start to read the introduction and I started to cry. I thought, oh, it's good. Oh, I forgot how good it was. And he's just sort of, you know, smug about it. I mean, it was so great. It was what I needed to be reminded. But what I notice about us as women is that we really quickly take away the best parts of our successes as women leaders. We discount it. I hear women say, you know, if I were to congratulate you on a, on a uh, promotion or something, I hear women say, oh, it was just luck, or right place at the right time, I guess, or whatever we say. We don't say, we rarely say, thank you. Thank you. It was worth every bit of hard work that I put into it, and I'm really honored and proud to be here. So we disempower ourselves through our own thinking and our own kind of you know, mental processes. We are disempowered. There's still plenty of writing being, um, I actually went to a talk the other night, a couple of weeks ago, called, um, called Women in the Glass Ceiling. I was thinking, we still have that darn old glass ceiling? <laughs> yeah, we do. That's, you know, so the whole evening was about what is it? How does it get put in place? We know for sure there are three things that limit women leaders in corporations and institutions today. The very first is the negative stereotyping that still exists about women. We don't have, as a collective, that's men and women, clear ideas that a woman actually can lead the country. We're not sure that a woman, a woman is the best person to be the CEO. We doubt that collectively. So it'll be interesting in this next election, won't it? Mm -hmm. To see if we have enough sort of faith to elect or to, to, to move forward a woman political leader. So that, that's the first thing, negative stereotyping. Now, unfortunately, that's the hardest one to impact. Because stereotypes run deep. That, you know, a stereotype is an un-
conscious, automatic way of thinking. We have, you know, sometimes stereotypes about teenagers or elderly people or you name the, the group and I'll give you the negative stereotype that we have. It's automatic. So we start to shift. So we have to, you know, the, the challenge is to shift negative stereotypes with positive uh, interactions that oppose those stereotypes. That's how we shift it. That's why, did, did anyone watch Commander in Chief? the series. Mm -hmm. Whether you agreed with that or not, the attempt was to impact our negative stereotyping mm -hmm. about a woman as commander-in-chief. I was sorry that it didn't run longer. Mm -hmm. I it, think got it, better made, it got better and better as it went. So that's the, the very first um, thing that limits women. The, I'm going to try to remember now, I should know this, the three things that, <coughs> three things that limit <laughs> women. Oh, hang on. It'll come. I'll come back to it. So we know for sure that one. I'll come back to the others. So we have a collective um, uh, uh, disempowerment of women that happens. And then we have a third disempowerment that happens, and that's women to women. What I hear when women are given a new post in leadership, I hear other women sort of sniping. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wonder who she knows. I wonder who she slept with. I wonder all the things that are said that we say about each other. Now, whether or not you've said that, I, know I, I have participated in gossip about other women. So a part of the way that we start to impact or break up our own disempowerment is by being conscientious about the way we disempower other women by the way we doubt or question. You know, one of the things that I'm most committed to in our women's leadership offerings is that we talk straight, that we actually talk about what's real. And we don't sort of be nice. They're not, the, the meetings, the gatherings that we have for women leaders aren't uh, feel good necessarily. They're actually intended to be disruptive. Because if we hope to gain any momentum or any ground in this, we have to disrupt the status quo. We can't have nice, polite gatherings and conversations. We have to be able to identify on those three levels how we're disempowering ourselves, each other collectively, and each other as women. And there's conversations that are designed to dig into that. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Um, so, what, what we know for sure with these statistics is that the health and well-being of a society, a corporation, and an institution are increased when women, when there are increased levels of women in leadership. Now, we kind of, didn't you kind of know that intuitively? Did you have a sense of that? Like, it just seems like it's better if there's a woman at the executive table, or two, or four, than if there's not. Mm -hmm. Now, what I would say is it, it makes a greater difference if a woman is in her feminine at the leadership table. Because going back to what we said earlier, we know that there, there are many of us who sold out to fit in. I did that all through the 80s. You remember when dress for success was the big thing? Mm -hmm. And it was suits and bow ties and, do you remember that? Did you, how many of you wore bow ties? <laughs> scarves. Oh, bow scarves. Scarves. Oh, scarves. Oh, good. It's a, scarves. Kind of a tie. Yes. Yeah, we did that, right? Because that was what that was what you had to do. I remember, you know, the popular thing when I was in just beginning my career in the early 80s, my boss said don't ever ever wear a dress to work unless you want people to think you're a secretary. Really? That was that was my coaching in the early 80s. So Now that's that's what we've been up against. And what I love is to see now the way we're dressing. You know, there's some subtle shifts that are happening now at work and, and starting to break up some of these things. Okay. So what I want to offer then by way of your teaching is this is all well and good. So how do we become better as women leaders? So this is just for you. This is designed just for you. So I have over the last few years actually come up with some what we call secrets. You know how everybody loves a secret. 
we were at, um, this is funny, we were up at um, yeah, Roach Harbor up in the islands and we saw Victoria's Secrets, um, boat, her, her, what do they call it? The big, big yacht. Yes. Anyway, she, she was, it was anchored up there, not she, um, I don't know if she's a she. Is she a she? <laughs> I don't know. And the, the company Victoria's Secret? Victoria's oh, okay. Secret. So yeah. the yacht had Victoria's Secret on the side of it, and the little dinghy was called Shh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, well, that's a good secret. <laughs> All right, so here's a few. I'm going to give you a couple of secrets. So the first secret to, to great leadership is to follow your passion. I say you must do what you love. Often as women, we don't even know what that is. We run into a lot of women in our workshops who say, you know, I've gotten so far away from it, or I haven't had the experience in so long, I can't even remember it or name it. So a part of our work then is to unearth what it is that you love, because it's there. It's not like, I've never yet met a person who doesn't have something that they're passionate about, ever. And I have worked with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So. Part of our work then is to discover or uncover. You know, often as women, we know what other people love. Don't you know what your children love and your husband loves and your partner loves and your boss loves? And yet we don't often know what we love. So part of, I remember when I first began my own leadership development, trying to sort that out, not really knowing. So where I started <clears throat> was with what I didn't love. I thought, okay, I'm just going to make a list first of all the things that I hate. That seems, I mean, don't, you can name those pretty fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or all the things that annoy me about my job or about my life or about whatever. So I just started making a list. And from that then, I was sort of able to flip it and start to figure out, oh, so if I know I don't love this, well, then I know I love this. So through process of elimination is one way to figure out what you love. There's a woman named Barbara Sher who's written some great books. She wrote a book called Wishcraft, mm -hmm. um, which we draw some of our work from. That is a wonderful book for uncovering passion and figuring out what it is that you love. So as I began my own leadership journey, I figured out, oh, I love working with women. Now, you know, in the beginning of my career, I was rarely in a room with any women. I did leadership development. And there was maybe one woman in the room of 30. So I started, and I noticed I would always resonate with that one woman. I'd always feel like, ah, we have something in common. And I would notice that I would speak to her. So I found my own passion, so to speak, by looking at first what I didn't love and figuring out what I loved. So what we know for sure is that great leaders consciously choose to follow what they love. You know it right away when a leader is doing something that they don't love, don't you? Mm -hmm. you? You can see it in their eyes when they get up. You can see it when they're trying to sell you a vision that they don't have their heart wrapped around. So I look at one of our central challenges as women leaders is only do what you love. Now that could be a big challenge for some who are in doing things that they don't love. You know, our work, as I said, can rattle people. It sometimes means that a job change is needed or a job reimagining. You know, how can you reimagine this or how can you reinvent this job that you're in? So we know that great leaders know what they love and from that then, they have a great ability to say yes to what they love and no to what they don't love. And they stay in tune and in touch with their bodies and their hearts and their heads and keep following that. It's like a kind of true north. And it will always lead you to the right place. I remember hearing somebody a few weeks ago say, if there's ever a question between your head and your heart, ask your heart. It'll tell the truth. the truth. The heart won't lie. And by the way, the heart is much more connected to the body. And so the body, you know your body never lies? Never lies. I, I, I saw a woman get up to speak one time and she 
made some, I remember she said something about she wasn't nervous, and this blotch was crawling up the side of her face. I thought, somebody's nervous in there. It might not be you. So your body will never lie. You know, you can always follow that. It'll tell you. Get headaches or stomach aches, usually an indication that something isn't working. So we look there. That's the great news about being a woman is that we have usually greater connection to our physical being. All right, that's the first secret. Follow what you love. The second is to make yourself your number one priority. This is a place where women usually gasp. Where do you think you are in your list of priorities? Where do you usually fall if you had five priorities? Where are you? Three. Six. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Off the bottom of the chart. Three. Good. That's a, actually making the list is good. Often we are at the bottom. And we've actually been trained that way by our culture. Do you know that this is cultural training? We're trained to take care of others first. Now again, in developing countries, this is more blatant or more visible. In Bangladesh, the girls are not allowed to go to school. Their job is to get up at age three and four and five years old and cook dinner for their brothers who are going to school and their fathers who are going to work. And they stay home and they clean and cook and prepare the meals for when the boys return. Now that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Here, what did you do this morning? What did you do this weekend? What did I do? Who got put first? So we just have to look in our own culture, in our own training to say, how did we accept being last? Does that make sense? Now, our work says flip it. Put yourself as your number one priority and just figure out what would happen. And I mean self with a big S, not a small s. You know, your small self is your personality or your ego. Your big self is that part of you that makes a contribution and makes a difference in the world. Put that self first. Figure out what that self needs. What we know is that women usually give out you know, energy, give out time, like a 12-lane freeway. And yet we have it coming back toward us like a straw. Does that make sense? We have it going out in droves, and we have it coming back in a little teeny tiny straw, or maybe a dirt road, to keep the road analogy going. So part of what we want to do is figure out how to have an equal distribution of energy out and energy back in, and energy out and energy back in, and figure out what you might do to have that happen. Where you give out too much energy and there's no return at all. You know, the dilemma of having young children is it's all energy out and very little energy back in. Now that's just a part of those years, and yet some of us continue the pattern. Okay. So uh, we were doing, I just want to share a short story. I don't, how much time do I have, Lynn? You, you tell 30 me. 30 minutes, and so um, we're we good? started at what? At about 1 or 11.40? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we have just a few more minutes. Yeah, another Great. Minutes. Okay, good. So here's the third, I don't want to do that story, I want to tell you the secret, the third secret. So the third secret that we, that we share about in the book is called keeping good company. And this is all about having you start to become very present to the company that you keep. You know, who is surrounding you? And what do they bring to your life and what do you bring to theirs? So to go back to the idea of energy out and energy back in, the place to look is, is there an even exchange? And if there isn't, is there a way to create it to be an even exchange? Could you stop doing so much and allow yourself to be contributed to? Do you know some of us are hard to contribute to? Do you know that? You'd have to ask. I know I, I'm very hard to contribute to. I, I often have so many things done and so on top of things that people say, well, like, I don't know, I don't know how to help. I don't, you have it all done, or it's, you're ahead of me, or you're faster, or 
you want it your way. <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm the martyr, you know. Oh, I have to do it all alone, but really I want to do it that way. Because I have to have it a certain way. So keeping good company is, is to start to look at who is in your life. We actually ask women to make a list of everyone who they interact with at least once in a week. You know, all the people. And then to start to look at how is that relationship? What does it bring to you? You know, some people bring joy and challenge and inspiration. And other people bring irritation and annoyance and burden. Do you know that you've ever been around people who sort of drain your energy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's starting to figure out how, what is the company you keep? And how would you surround yourself with more life-giving company? So, you know, just as we approach this huge topic of women's leadership and kind of how do we begin and where do we work, I would say, you know, make sure that you're doing what you love. That's the first thing for you to do. You cannot lead effectively well from something that you don't love. The second is to make yourself your number one priority. Make sure you're in good shape, that you have the energy to give, that you have the clarity and contribution to make. And the third is to keep good company. Figure out who's around you and who should stay around you or who you would attract toward you so that you can increase your own base of leadership. And you know, I just as I close, what I'd like to offer is, um, you know, as I look at each one of you, I know you're a leader. I know you're a leader in, in all the ways that you lead. And what I know is that it's time for each of us to step up, to have, to have bigger voices, to make more of the difference that we all know we can make. And I know that it's needed. It's needed from each one of us at this table. And it's needed from all of those women that we have the privilege of interacting with in this building and in this company. And what I know is that um, the patriarchy, I'll call it that, the hierarchy, is, feels like a big, solid, wooden door sometimes. And one person, one woman pushing on it cannot budge it. But a hundred of us, or a thousand of us, can. We can actually, you know, push it. And that, you know, um, that's really what I'm asking for us to do together, is to figure out how do we all push together? Because just like the Berlin Wall, you know, there were a lot of people pushing when that wall came down. There were a lot of individual acts that, that had the end of communism be a reality. And that's really what I'm inviting us all to, is that uh, a great, grand pushing together. So I really appreciate the opportunity just to even have 30 minutes land. <laughs> and um, thank you for um, allowing us to videotape and um, just to, to join you in this. Well, before we let you go, let me ask what questions, follow-up comments does anyone have? Well, for somebody that just got a book out on Thursday, I think you ought to sign me. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> proud. Kind of my first book sign. Yes. How wonderful you think it is, and how great you feel of handing it out to all of us as your first contribution to help us. Thank you. It's a wonderful idea. <laughs> yeah. So we pass our book. Send your book. Can I use your pen? Absolutely. Oh, good. And now she's learning your name. I'm Margaret. M A R G A R E. And as she's doing that, what, what other comments, questions does anyone have? Well, I, I just really appreciated your talk because I've always been told to lower my voice. See, I'm doing it now. Yeah. Uh, because I've worked in a man's field, forestry, forest ranger, firefighter, and first they said I was short and a midget ranger. And then they'd say, well, talk, you have a little mouse voice. You know, no one's going to listen to you if you have a mouse voice. And I just, I guess that's, I've always been afraid to speak in meetings and that because I think, oh, they're going to think I'm squeaky or I'm going right. to hurt someone's ear. Right. So that was interesting. I never really thought about being trained to do that way. But when you said yeah. she hasn't lasted wow. 15 years, that was sad to me. Mm -hmm. 
because that yeah. we do hold back and you were talking about emotions and I you brought tears to my eyes mm -hmm. and I thought well maybe it's okay to talk like that yeah. even though some people might say well women cry or women can't they're emotional but I it's I think it's good to hear it and to encourage that so I'm gonna start thinking more like a woman Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But, no, but you think of what we do, and like you said, uh, motherhood, worker, uh, chauffeur, whatever. I mean, we are CEOs of our domain. Yeah. We do everything. And why not be managers or yeah. leaders right. in the workplace? Yeah. And We're running families. We're running communities. Mm -hmm. But I just, I'm hit, hitting roadblocks like the door you said with my first line supervisor, but if I can just be true to myself, then maybe with time it will, that's what I heard today, maybe mm, with time it so will. That's so great. Really? Did I get it? I'm thrilled that's what I heard. Oh, yay! <laughs> no, it's very encouraging. Yeah, where do we start? We just start right here. Because mm -hmm. I always want to, you know, I get <clears throat> kind of teary-eyed and I always want to, oh, you don't cry, you don't show emotion because they're going to say you can't take it. Right. But now maybe it's okay to be a little mm -hmm. emotional. Let them know that their their behavior is hurting. You know, because if they if they don't stop with you, then they're going to continue on with others. Hmm. I too have choked down the tears, and and after this talk, next time I'm going to go, ouch. Yeah. Right. Or just let them know. Let them know that you have feelings. Well, We've the other ways there's no there's no change. And I remember I was working with some men some years ago, and and. There was an email that was going out that was said, "Let's march into hell together." I said, "No Let's woman march." First of all, why go there? <laughs> and, and women aren't inspired by marching into hell. Yeah, it's not, not you thing. know. So there's the war metaphors and the sports metaphors, and there's lots of ways of being and participating that are not grasping women's attention. And we know that, you know, as there's a great organization called Half the Sky. We're half the sky. Wow. So, you know, where do we begin? Just right here. I mean, that's really, the book is just about that. Just begin right here. There's no sort of heroic acts rather than, other than maybe getting rid of a few whiny people in your circle. <laughs> well, I just, I'm going to talk again. I hope it's okay. Please. Uh, I wrote the train to California, 23-hour trip on the train, and I listened, I got Martin Luther King's uh, famous speeches, and, uh, you know, he's one, he was one person, right? It started yes, with one person? he was one person. And uh, that's, I was kind of relating the African-American struggle to the women's struggle, and he was real inspiring it because you know, he was a preacher, but he also brought out a lot of these emotion. He wasn't afraid of emotion mm -hmm. and love and what people might say are feminine characteristics. That's or right. Christian characteristics. But I was so moved by that, too. I think it's maybe my age, my the, the age I'm in, I'm, I want to do something with my life, you mm -hmm. know, be somebody. Mm -hmm. so that's this. Thank you. I think you'd, you'd probably change my life today if you don't know it. <laughs> oh, Lori, this is wonderful. Wonderful to hear. And I think it's very timely, too, after the appointment of the first president of Harvard University. Oh, no, yesterday. Yay, isn't that great? It is great. But unfortunately, it made, made headlines, and yeah. it shouldn't. Well, the first it, female speaker of the house. Yeah, mm -hmm. first female yeah. speaker of the house well, this year. presidential candidate. Yes. It's a big, serious. big yeah. time. She said they made headlines, so they had Nicole Smith. Yeah. Oh, and then, yeah. 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 There's yeah. a few like women in the headlines. And then the thing. And that, that, I guess, is like, things get discouraging for me. It's like, you think we're, you know, yeah. And then I'm rising above so and back. Yeah. 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 It's discouraging. Yeah. But as a community, we've got to support these women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Them. It's a great conversation. Yeah. I really am, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm grateful that you are the steering committee for women in action. Whatever work gets done, I know it will make a difference, even if you don't know it. It may be, you know, that one meeting or that one conversation that changes somebody's mm -hmm. life.
way of your, 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 your big wooden door analogy. Mm. So we're wood products company. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, very, very this wooden door. Yeah. <laughs> and we're all pushing. Uh, well fortified. Yeah. yeah, you're working in a pretty male dominant male dominant mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. You know? And the the reality is there's a lot of those. Mm -hmm. I can't name too many non male dominated industries. Mm -hmm. Nursing, Pepsi maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's true. But I, on the other side, I want to give our company credit yeah. in that when our leader decided that I need to do something, he did something. Yeah. So we ha do have females now yeah. that are our leaders, and I believe yeah. he got it. Great. And he did something. So Great. as companies go, I think that we're very fortunate and that Warehouser's more open and is walking the talk of it than the average company out there. It's great. So mm -hmm. you just throw that out there because I'm I'm happy that we've made the progress we have and that the, the you know man the man dominated leadership has mm -hmm. now turned the corner I think for us. Mm -hmm. Well I found it pretty mm -hmm. fascinating the statistics that you mentioned and I can't help but think that that's a big driver mm -hmm. behind you know the better profits yeah. the, I mean that's it's, it makes business sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It makes to be good business as well. Mm -hmm. so it's, yeah. Well, and the reality of it is, as women, we want to be included because we make good business sense. We're not yeah. trying to be included mm -hmm. simply because we are women. We are women who bring something to the table, right. and, and that's what we're trying to get people to understand. I think um, one of the things I heard you say um, resonated with me around being authentic. Those aren't your words, but that, right. that to me, if you're, if you're a woman leader, you must be authentic, or people are going to see, they're going to see through that. Yeah. Um, I think we had our telephone conference call a couple of weeks ago or something, mm -hmm. and, and we were talking a little bit about women, and one of the things I said was that it's important when women do get in roles of leadership that we bring ourselves to the table, yep. that we don't try to mimic right. men, because then we're not, we're not really adding all of the value that we can bring to the party. So. Right. I think that's and that's that actually ends up to be a pretty big challenge because mm -hmm. we have been men for so long we don't even remember. Right. You know, I I you know I go home and there's two men in the house. And you ask my husband. Poor woman. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's just two of us, and I'm bossing him around, and he's you know. So and then we we find ourselves sort of attracting weaker males. Why? Because we're so strong. Mm -hmm. Or we find ourselves alone because we're so strong. Or we find ourselves alone, you know. Or you find yourself fighting for power. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's kind of an ongoing. So it's it's no small thing to step back into the feminine. I mean, I, you know, my theme for this year is surrender. Do you know I don't want to do it? <laughs> surrender. Why? Because it's important for me to, you know, to surrender, and I get stubborn and set and and masculine. Mm -hmm. So I love what you're saying because I think that is one of our central challenges to bring our authenticity as a woman, whatever that is, for you. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's really the work. That's great. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.